Curiosity is a very interesting phenomenon. It is not purely biological and not purely philosophical either. It possesses adaptive advantages, but it can also be detrimental. It's not necessarily a personality dimension and not exactly a biologically ingrained emotion either. So what is curiosity? We know curiosity is innate. It is universal across humans, but varies in how it functions. It possesses a basic element in our cognition and guides us in directions that can make us successful, both as a species and as individuals. And the nature of curiosity is inherently a pervasive one. It affects pretty much every single corner of our lives, but does so in a subtle way that makes it hard to quantify. Consider the amount of time we spend seeking and consuming information, whether listening to music, podcasts, or through reading books or watching sports. Essentially, the pursuit of any activity that is not directly related to basic survival can be considered a form of curiosity. Despite its universal applicability, the biology of curiosity as a formal study is still hindered in its development. And this is primarily because curiosity is so hard to categorize. So to proceed, I think the best practice would be to define what curiosity is. Curiosity is a desire, an intrinsic motivation for the pursuit of something we want. Usually this takes shape in the form of information, but not always. Our interests can be quite abstract, as in the case of curiosity regarding something like art or play, music or exploration. So curiosity can't exactly be defined as information seeking and has to be separately categorized into its own phenomenon. To date, the best way to explain curiosity is as an impulse for better cognition, the desire to learn more about what you know that you don't know. As an example, it's well documented that in children, because everything is so novel and exciting, curiosity manifests itself as a desire for exposure. So these children can then learn and adapt to their new environments. This was an idea first put forth by psychologist William James, and the idea has been backed up by animal studies on curiosity. Ivan Pavlov, for example, discussed dogs' spontaneous orientating behavior towards new stimuli, and he referred to this reflex as a manifestation of curiosity. Animal exploratory behavior also has to be driven by some innate curiosity to diverge into new landscapes. And as a result, some behaviors categorize curiosity as a fundamental drive, prompting animals to engage in problem-solving activities, even if there's no immediate reward. But perhaps the most puzzling aspect of curiosity is the intrinsic motivation that comes with it. Our interests are not exactly things we choose to be interested in. Instead, it's more like something that grips us something we want to learn more about, but can't exactly pinpoint why we want to learn more about it. And context just makes the puzzling nature of curiosity even more, well, curious. Consider a child that has an option between entering two doors. One is a safe haven, the other more risky. If the child chooses the risky door and opens it, does this mean the child is more curious, or does it mean the child is more of a risk taker? The answer is not exactly straightforward. And so for the purpose of this video, Let's define curiosity as a desire to learn more, a decision to pursue an outcome for many different reasons, just like someone making the decision to pursue any basic element of survival. So what drives curiosity can be internal or external, conscious or unconscious, slowly evolved or culturally reinforced, and of course, any mix of all of them. In its broadest sense, information has value to an organism only insofar as the organism has the capability to make use of that information. The benefits can be immediate or delayed, but if delayed, which is usually the case, the curiosity to pursue information would require a learning system. Therefore, it's not a stretch to assume curiosity is an adaptive trait stemming from a motivation to learn, to map out one's environment. Information is obviously advantageous. It can tell you what landscapes or foods to avoid, what territories have the most resources, and where you're likely to encounter predators. And this is an idea that's built upon through the evolution of senses. Any complex organism actively manipulates senses, favoring some over others in order to maximize the intake of information from a given region. As an example, Gottlieb and colleagues demonstrated in 2012 that our eyes constantly fixate on the most important thing to us at any given moment, be it a danger or something positive. And it's actually why we have sclera, the white part of the eyes, as it helps others identify what we are looking at. But simple organisms like bacteria also engage in a simplistic type of information seeking as well, which can help us bridge the gap in understanding the fundamental building blocks of curiosity. Gathering information or learning likely stems from an evolved inclination to explore. 
In studies on C. elegans, a type of worm with a very basic nervous system, it's well documented that when these worms are placed in a new environment, they actively spend about 15 minutes exploring before suddenly making rapid adjustments and heading at a specific target, which seems to suggest the worm's behavior being driven by a desire to learn more about its environment. With the goal of maximizing both immediate rewards in the form of food and long-term information in the form of mapping out its environment. While by itself this study can't really help us much, it can when paired with studies in primates. The K-Arm Bandit task is an information studying task put forth by Giddens and Jones in 1974. It's based off a stochastic system, which means the outcome or value of the reward is not determined with certainty, but rather follows a probability distribution meaning each time an action is taken or a task is performed, the reward associated with it may vary. In this task, participants balance exploring unknown options to gain information with exploiting known options for immediate payoffs. Only humans and monkeys have shown proficiency in this balancing act, possessing the ability to weigh potential future benefits against immediate gains. When the forearm bandit task was conducted on humans, the participants didn't always choose the same option repeatedly. Instead, they picked options based on their expected values. But for the purpose of information gathering, every now and then, random selections took place. This randomness was used to help explore new possibilities, map out potential rewards, and lead to better overall decision-making in the long term. This study conducted by Daw in 2006 showed that different parts of the brain light up during exploration compared to when the immediate gain was expected. So when decisions with expected values were made, the striatum and ventral medial prefrontal cortex were more active. But when random exploratory choices were made to gather information, the frontal polar cortex and the intraparietal sulcus were more active. Because these areas are known for processing rewards, this means curiosity is directly linked to our brain's reward system. And the researchers suggested that when we explore, higher level regions of the brain step in to guide our decisions, overriding our tendency to stick with what we know. In another experiment, scientists found that neurons in the posterior cingulate cortex fire more consistently during exploratory trials compared to ones where the outcome was already known. Shining a light on the role of the posterior cingulate cortex in both initiating and sustaining exploration. This region of the brain is also tied to the dopaminergic reward system, hinting at a connection between these processes and curiosity. But interestingly enough, the posterior cingulate cortex responds not just to the value of a reward, but also to how intriguing an option is, which is what curiosity is. Humans have a tendency to seek out novelty, and one hypothesized reason is because new unfamiliar things may offer more information than familiar things. And in a study by Whitman and colleagues in 2008, the bandit task was modified to explore this very idea. In one modified version, participants had to pick between four different pictures in a revolving series of rounds. The identity of the pictures were random but didn't change in value, just used to give participants different options. However, for the participants, the worth of the different pictures was unpredictable, and so they had to try the pictures in order to figure out how valuable they were. Some pictures were old and some were new but being new didn't change the value of the picture for the task. Still, people tended to pick the new pictures more often, showing that the novelty led to a curiosity to explore. The researchers called this curiosity the novelty bonus. Surprisingly, this bonus made people expect more reward from the new pictures, which were shown in the form of more activity in the ventral striatum during brain imaging, which again, suggests the dopaminergic reward system must play some central role in curiosity, and novelty for that matter. With this in mind, the fundamental roots of curiosity can be linked to something called neoteny, which means the retention of juvenile characteristics. Humans as adults are much more childlike than any other animal. We retain our ability to play, we are relatively hairless compared to all other animals, and have larger brains. It's therefore been hypothesized that the origin of our lifeline curiosity stems from this behavioral characteristic of neoteny. Evolution, by making us retain more juvenile characteristics, has come with both costs and benefits. But by far the most advantageous trait is our capacity to learn for an extended period of time, well into late adulthood, which can be used to learn much more from our environment. If it is our neoteny's traits that have played a role in developing curiosity, then it makes sense to study curiosity when it is at its most vital, 
in infancy. Curiosity has long been a staple of infant development. When first born, infants are bombarded with a wealth of information, but their limited cognitive resources require them to select specific material for learning. This is known as the sampling problem, and it involves efficiently choosing what to focus on for effective learning. Infants possess basic heuristics that guide their attention toward informative aspects of their environment. For example, they are naturally drawn to high contrast or motion, which aid in object detection and perception of threats. Infants also possess a tendency to focus on and recognize faces, which provides social cues and supports language learning. These basic heuristics help infants begin their journey of acquiring knowledge. However, infants must also adapt to changing needs as they develop mental representations of the world. Early theories suggest that novelty was the primary stimulus of interest for infants, but later theories propose that infants' preferences for novelty or familiarity depended on their evolving knowledge states. For example, infants may prefer stimuli that are partially familiar, but also novel in some way. Recent research with infants supports these theories, showing that infants are most likely to look away from events that are either really predictable or very surprising. Instead, attention is maintained when something provides an intermediate level of novelty, which is thought to optimize the learning process. Play behavior in general, whether in infants or adults, is thought to be a learning mechanism used to uncover the unknowns of the world. This aligns with Jean Payette's theory that curiosity and play are essential for constructing knowledge through an interaction with the environment. And in a recent study by Schultz and Bonowitz, children demonstrated a clear preference for toys that allowed them to uncover causal relationships. The toys were familiar, but had a degree of novelty, which made the children curious to try and uncover the association between this novelty with the familiar aspect of the toy. In one scenario, children played with boxes, with some setups deliberately designed to cause confusion in the cause and effect relationship between the different components of the toy. Despite the presence of a new toy, children in these experiments were drawn to the toys that offered opportunities to unravel the mysteries of cause and effect, which suggests children actively seek out experiences that challenge their understanding and help them make sense of the world around them. This requires both a familiar and novel aspect, but also requires a level of exploratory testing this testing behavior is widely observed in children, who structure their play to untangle complex cause and effect relationships. Pair this with what we know about the relationship between curiosity and the dopaminergic reward system, and it's clear that children's curiosity is finely tuned to facilitate learning and information gathering about the environment around them. Evidence for this idea is further built upon, funnily enough, through AI modeling. In the world of artificial intelligence, Algorithms consistently follow evolutionary teachings in order to maximize outcomes. And this is no exception when applied to behavioral evolution. When algorithms designed to explore behavioral evolution are developed, it was found that even the best algorithms are unable to improve if they are not designed to explore. Without a small tweak in an exploratory metric, the algorithms get stuck in a rut and rely on producing the same responses over and over again. So to overcome this problem, computer scientists have developed something called the exploration bonus, a reward that's received when the algorithm tries something new. Due to its redesign and modeling, the algorithms shift and begin offering new solutions along with the old ones. And throughout time, the algorithm becomes more knowledgeable, even if it's at the cost of some sort of short-term opportunity. The parallel between how algorithms learn and our own mind, especially during infancy, is pretty clear. Dopamine, released through the dopaminergic reward system, is evolution's built-in exploratory bonus, guiding curiosity. We're evolved to try things out, pay attention to novelty, and focus on the long-term benefits of information gathering, even if there is an associated cost. Which brings up another point, how does novelty fit into all of this? It's been suggested that both curiosity and creativity stem from the same fundamental principles of pursuing novelty. And for a long time, this was a perplexing case, as decision-making and information gathering has typically been touted as an involved mechanism for obtaining rewards. However, many decisions are influenced by factors other than the value of a reward, and chimpanzees have also been documented to pursue novel objects even if they have no associated reward, simply because they are new. So why is novelty so powerful? Another function of curiosity, put forward by Berline in 1960, suggests curiosity stems from a drive to resolve uncertainty. 
even if this uncertainty does not lead to a reward. And the idea makes sense. Uncertainty can be dangerous, and even if the information does not lead to better outcomes, it aids in mapping out the environment and directing movement. Novelty in its essence is uncertainty, but it is important to make the distinction between different types of novelty, or the spectrum of how new something is. Something can be completely unfamiliar, and something can be familiar but still novel in some way. As an example, encountering a futuristic alien entity is something that would be completely novel, whereas encountering a tall person who's maybe 6'8 is novel but still familiar because I'm sure you've seen someone tall before. As a result, our fixation on novelty seems to circle back to learning, and curiosity, novelty, and learning are all intricately connected. A region in our midbrain called the substantial nigra ventral segmental area is activated under any encounter with novel stimuli. It plays a role in connecting the hippocampus and amygdala, both of which play vital roles in learning and memory. The hippocampus aids in comparing the novelty to familiar components through memory, while the amygdala responds to emotional input, strengthening associations. In a study conducted by Bunzek and Duzel, fMRI imaging was used to see how brains respond to novelty. Dubbed the oddball experiment, participants were shown images of indoor and outdoor scenes with occasional faces thrown in, meant to be the oddball or random novel picture. The experiment found the substantial nigra ventral segmental area activated during exposure to novel images, but only if the novelty was very high. If the pictures had a familiar touch, were only slightly deviated from more familiar images, fMRI imaging didn't pick up the same effect. Now this is somewhat contradictory to what we laid out about the neuroscience of curiosity in the developmental stages of infants. But it makes sense when we consider the dopaminergic reward system again. Dopamine is more closely linked to motivation than it is to reward itself. And in the context of completely unfamiliar stimuli, dopamine is released to motivate us into exploring this unknown. In the early stages of life, almost everything is novel to an infant. And so to learn, but also survive, infants are wired, so to speak, to pursue relative novelty to maximize the chances of both learning and surviving. As we age, on the other hand, mental maps of the world begin to adjust. They orient us and direct us toward the pursuit of more advantageous outcomes. And so in this state, when we see something completely new, built off prior experience of pursuing relative novelty, our dopamine system motivates us to pursue this absolute novelty with the promise that there could be something potentially rewarding associated with this. For this reason, the midbrain is activated only when faced with something completely new. At this stage, the dynamic between relative and absolute novelty and which one produces more curiosity is still an area of debate. So to further elaborate on the distinction between the two and which one creates more curiosity, the best resources we have to turn to is not scientific research, but actually marketing research, which is a good segue into the next section, marketing and design. In today's environment, to say we're constantly bombarded with ads is an understatement. Ads are played before YouTube videos, during sports, while walking through cities and on pretty much any piece of online info. 95% of these ads get skipped or are completely forgotten, but some seep through, some make a name for themselves, and some obviously work. So what makes the difference? Curiosity invoking ads typically contain what neuroscientists call curiosity triggers. There are many different types, but the most well studied are the information gaps, ambiguity, and novelty. And what they all have in common is the creation of a discrepancy between what people think they know about something and what they actually know. Circling back to the definition of curiosity Berlin gave earlier, the drive to resolve uncertainty. Curiosity evokes an emotional tension, an emotional tension that needs to be resolved, so much so that when people are curious, exploration is initiated by a motivation to diminish this tension. As an example, if something very new creates tension, we seek it out to make this new object familiar, and as a result, relieve that tension. Of course, the key is that the information must be of interest first. In a study by Dom and colleagues in 2019, three different situations were set up to spark curiosity. One utilized information gaps, another used ambiguity, and a third used novelty. In the study, Fake ads were designed for well-known brands using one of the three methods to trigger curiosity. As an example, using the information gap theory, one ad gave a little bit of information and then asked participants if they'd be willing to scan a QR code. Then, they gave them more information on a web page and asked for their thoughts. In another version, the ad was made ambiguous. 
So for example, the researchers showed participants a picture of a woman with socks next to a tablet and then asked about the socks, even though they didn't matter at all in the context of the product. And finally, in the last ad, the researchers utilized novelty by simply putting a new label on the product. The results showed that information gaps, purposefully leaving out information, was effective in creating curiosity. But surprisingly, labeling something as new didn't inspire curiosity, even though previous marketing studies suggested it would. The researchers hypothesized that people are so used to seeing new labels on products nowadays that it already has created a sense of familiarity. And this is the reason why novelty didn't inspire curiosity in this context. Interestingly though, curiosity triggered by information gaps led to positive emotions and exploration, but when ambiguity was the curiosity trigger, these positive effects weren't seen. This is probably because relative novelty in the form of ambiguity creates motivation for us to solve the problem, not have the solution be given to us right away, which was the case in the ads that used ambiguity. The last takeaway was that when information gaps also created ambiguity, it led to a better attitude toward the product, suggesting that when people have to think harder to understand something, it makes it more enjoyable and enhances curiosity. In another study of design innovation by Eugene He and Jiang Lao, the concluding results found that for most products, having a medium level of novelty provides the highest return on investment, but that extreme levels of novelty can also boost value. However, the extreme unfamiliarity of such products can lead to polarizing results. As such, most designers for products are advised to aim for a sweet spot of newness, which suggests relative novelty is better at invoking curiosity in this context. While the debate between relative and absolute novelty is still ongoing, the key takeaway from these studies is that the amount of novelty that can invoke curiosity is more dependent on the context or the environment than anything else. Obviously, if you're watching this video and you've gone this far, you're probably a very curious, inquisitive person, which I commend you on, by the way. But in this last part, I wanted to highlight ways to make one more curious, to see if there are any scientific-backed methods we can use to improve our own curiosity, to improve our own exploratory behavior. So if curiosity is internal, if our interests are something we don't have control over, is it still something we can pique? In the marketing portion, this answer seems obvious. Yes, of course we can. But the problem with the marketing strategies is the inquisitive nature of the individual must already be present. The product must be something the individual viewing the advertisement is already interested in. Which is why I pose this question. Can we enhance our own curiosity? Or our desire to learn more about something? Of all the different definitions for curiosity I laid out in this video, Kashtan and Sylvia in 2009 before the most comprehensive definition of curiosity to date. They describe curiosity as the recognition, pursuit, and intense desire to explore novel, challenging, or uncertain events. A mouthful, I know, but it does a great job of encompassing the totality of what curiosity really is, and in particular, because of the emphasis on exploration. Curiosity is a type of motivation, but that's not exactly right because it's more of a state in and of itself. So it's more like a narrow portion of intrinsic motivation, a focused subdimension. In this context, if curiosity is one portion of motivation, then it can be enhanced. In a study published by Harlow in 1950, intrinsic motivation was studied in rhesus monkeys. He found that the monkeys would continue trying to solve a mechanical puzzle even if no external award was presented. But what's even more interesting is that the researchers noted when rewards were given, the primates engaged in less spontaneous exploratory behavior, not more. In humans, intrinsic motivation thrives on encounters with novel stimuli that strike a delicate balance, so relative novelty. They must offer challenges that are neither overwhelming nor too familiar. So it goes without saying that some degree of challenge can act like a propellant for curiosity. This is actually why video games are so enjoyable. Along with that, decades of research put forth by Decky and Ryan in 1985 link positive feedback and choice to enhancing intrinsic motivation or our exploratory tendencies of curiosity. Completely contradictory to the study of positive reinforcement in rhesus monkeys. Now, humans are obviously very different than monkeys, but they're similar enough that this contradiction should still raise questions. The difference in the nature of the feedback and its effect lies in the context of the study. In Harlow's experiment, the rewards introduced were likely perceived by the monkeys as external reinforcements rather than a genuine expression of positive feedback. 
these rewards may have shifted the monkey's focus from the intrinsic enjoyment of exploration to the extrinsic pursuit of rewards, thereby diminishing the spontaneous curiosity. In contrast, when we talk about positive feedback enhancing intrinsic motivation in human studies, it's because the feedback reinforces feelings of competence and autonomy, qualities that are inherently satisfying to individuals. This kind of positive feedback fosters a sense of mastery and propels an individual forward. So while both positive feedback and rewards can influence behavior, the key distinction lies in whether they support an individual's sense of competence or whether they act as external reinforcements that overshadow the drive for exploration. But see, here lies the key. The key distinction in enhancing curiosity is whether the positive feedback is directed in a manner that fuels an individual's sense of competence. And this can be accomplished through goals. Since biological exploration or curiosity is so connected to the dopamine system, it makes sense to question whether it's possible for us to influence our dopamine in a manner that can make us more curious. The answer is, to an extent, yes. Yes, we can. We can do this through the creation of goals. Dopamine is involved in exploratory behavior. When we anticipate a reward through a self-determined worthy activity, neurons in the midbrain become active and release dopamine to various parts of the brain, such as the striatum. But setting goals is like a cheat code to start up this process. Creating a worthy pursuit engages the brain's executive functions, which are mediated by the prefrontal cortex. When we set a specific goal, our brain forms a mental representation of the desired outcome and maps out the necessary steps needed to achieve this goal. Doing this will release dopamine. As we previously laid out, the reward system is closely linked to motivation and the desire to pursue rewarding experiences. When we set a goal, whether it's to learn a new skill or solve a problem, the anticipation of achieving that goal activates the dopamine system and provides us with the drive to work towards it. Meaning just setting a goal can make you more curious with respect to this goal. Now, before I conclude, I want to make a distinction. Curiosity and what you're interested in are not the same thing. In fact, I would argue they are two completely separate entities. It's entirely possible to become curious about something you're not potentially interested in. Take the example of something very basic like water presented through the lens of a unique culturally relevant ad, just like in the form of Liquid Death's marketing strategies. But our interests are, for lack of a better word, an interesting phenomenon. We don't choose what we're interested in, instead it calls out to us. It grips us and guides us without any control on our part. As the saying goes, you don't choose what you're interested in, your interests choose you. There are some good reasons to improve curiosity, and chief among them is the fact that it can make us learn stuff we know to be worthwhile. Even so, even if there is a good reason, it's very hard to get interested in something you're just not that interested in. Imagine trying to study for an exam. If the subject is boring to you, it's impossible to just sit down and learn the thing. Millions of distractions, millions of thoughts and ideas will just flood your mind, working as one collective unit to pull you away from what you should be doing. But when you're interested in something, oh man, you're interested. You're laser focused. You tackle the object in question with precision. Procrastination has no burden. You can pay attention for as long as you want. You work until you're exhausted, not even realizing how many hours you've spent indulging yourself in this unique interest of yours. Which makes me think, if we can't control our interest, then what does? Carl Jung suggested it's your higher self. It's your potential calling out to you telling you to pursue what needs to be pursued in order for you to reach your higher being, the complete self, the potential you, gripping you in the present by guiding you through interests, directing you towards where you need to go. So I think interests differ from curiosity in the sense that they should act as your guide, moving you through life by telling you what to pursue and what to avoid in order for you to reach this higher state of being. But hey, that's just a closing thought. Until next time, cheers.